Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
at Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully, and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole world is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, We will do everything the Lord has said. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We speak responsibly to gradually. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. So that in all things, God may grace in Jesus Christ, to the end be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. The epistle is from the fifth chapter of Romans. St. Paul writes, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable. 
of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you in their synagogues. On my account you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father <coughs> speaking through you. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
today's gospel reading, in which our Lord appoints the twelve apostles and sends them out to preach in his name. There's a show on the History Channel called History's Mysteries about inexplicable but true events from our past. The commissioning of the Twelve Apostles presents us with one of history's greatest mysteries. How and why did this particular group of twelve men have such an extraordinary impact on our world? In the opening chapters of the Acts of the Apostles, Peter and John are brought before the Sanhedrin, the same body that had condemned Jesus to death and order to stop preaching in Jesus' name. Scripture reports that the Sanhedrin considered them unschooled, ordinary men, and that the leader of the Sanhedrin thought that the new faith these men were preaching would come to nothing. If during the events of today's gospel reading, you had been a fly on the wall, observing Jesus' speech to this group of twelve, as he sends them out to preach in his name. You probably would have thought the same. It will all come to nothing. For they were indeed unschooled, ordinary men, mostly former fishermen. They came from a remote backwater of the Roman Empire called Palestine, and not even from one of Palestine's larger cities, such as Jerusalem or Caesarea, but they were hicks from the sticks of Galilee. That's why someone once said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. By all appearances, they were country bumpkins, insignificant nobodies, who should have been long forgotten, and whose existence 2,000 years ago should have had zero impact on us today. In the book of Acts, when Paul and Silas begin preaching in Thessalonica, the enemies of the gospel declare, these men who have turned the world upside down have now come here. Whether or not you believe the message they proclaim, it is an indisputable fact in history that this small group of mostly former fishermen from a backward corner of the world 2,000 years ago really did turn the whole world upside down and utterly altered human history. Actually, they probably had a greater lasting impact on our world than any other group of people in all of human history. For in the two millennia since their commissioning that day, as recorded in today's Gospel reading, the central driving force in world history has been the message they went out and proclaimed. And that's history's mystery. How and why did they have such an extraordinary impact on our world? An impact that reaches down to us, gathered here 2,000 years later on the other side of the world to profess the same faith and proclaim the same message. The answer to this history's mystery is found in the very word apostle. The Greek word apostle means one who is sent forth, especially an official representative, such as an ambassador. As Paul later wrote, we are therefore Christ ambassadors. The twelve apostles were ambassadors to the world from the spiritual kingdom of Jesus Christ. Ambassadors with a two-part message for the world from King Jesus, as he told them just before he ascended into heaven, repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in my name to all nations. And that right there is the answer to this history's mystery. How and why this small group of mostly former fishermen from a backward corner of the world 2,000 years ago had such an extraordinary lasting impact on our world. How they completely changed human history. 
Because it wasn't they who did it at all. As Paul wrote, we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. The Lord promises in Isaiah, My word will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And Paul says in Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. God's word has power, divine power, far beyond any other force in human history. Power of God to accomplish what he desires. It was not the apostles themselves who turned the world upside down, but the message brought by these ambassadors from God. The two-part message of repentance and forgiveness of sins, law and gospel, the bad news of our sin, and the good news of our Savior. That message is what changed the course of human history. That message is why we are here today. First of all, repentance. Because the whole world is a prisoner of sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous, not even one. But that message of law, the bad news of our sin, is only part of God's message for the world. Christ's ambassadors not only diagnose the spiritual sickness of our sin, but they also prescribe the only cure possible, forgiveness of sins in his name. The gospel, the good news that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins in his name. The good news that the blood of Jesus God's Son cleanses you from every sin. So you are now holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. You see, every other religion or philosophy or ethical system also all preach in one way or another the bad news of our sins. But no other religion or philosophy in the world except Christianity goes on from the bad news of our sins to the good news of our Savior. The very word gospel means good news. And that's really what Christianity is all about. The good news of forgiveness of sins in his name. This unique message from God is what gives Christianity its unique power from God. And this message from God also gives you divine power for your life. Mother Teresa once said, I know God will not give me anything I can't handle. I just wish he didn't trust me so much. Like the apostles, who were assigned the task of bringing the gospel to the whole world, do you sometimes feel confronted with overwhelming responsibilities? Maybe you wish God didn't trust you so much. At your job, with your home and family, involvement in church, with other groups and organizations, you have the same power the apostles had to conquer the world. You have the power to meet the challenges of your life. The power of the word and sacraments and prayer. As Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you also have the comfort of forgiveness of sin in his name. You won't do it all. You can't do it all. Everything won't be just right. Everything won't be perfect. You will make mistakes. You will fall short. You will 
fail. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is your comfort when things don't go like you want them to, when you fall short, when you fail. The comfort of forgiveness of sins in His name. And you have the comfort of knowing that the apostles were not some kind of supernatural supermen. But as the book of Acts tells us, in and of themselves, they were ordinary men. The New Testament records in painful detail their many faults and failings. Peter, the head apostle, even while Jesus is on trial, calls down curses on himself and swears, I don't know the man. Matthew reports that faithful night, all of his disciples deserted him and fled. Thomas famously doubts the good news of the resurrection. Many times we see the twelve disciples arguing over who is the greatest among them. It seems that even at the Last Supper, they were jockeying for the best seat at the table. Ordinary men like you and me, with ordinary weaknesses and faults and failings, like you and me. In the same way, God wants to use you for His work in this world. You, despite your weaknesses, faults, and failings. Paul put it this way, we have this treasure in jars of clay. God has entrusted the treasure of His gospel and the task of His work in the world not to glorious, perfect treasure chests, not to supernatural supermen, but to jars of clay. Ordinary men, like the apostles, and you, and me. Perhaps more than ever, our society, and especially our marketing culture, is geared toward making us feel inadequate, imperfect, unworthy. One teen magazine advised its readers not to try to actually look like the models in their magazines. Because they admitted the secret is most of those models are actually three separate models. The head of one, the torso of another, and the legs of another. The perfect people you see in their pages literally don't exist. Time Magazine had a cover story about women struggling to be supermodel, how they feel guilty if they don't do it all and do it all perfectly. It's called the Martha Stewart Syndrome. She makes it look easy. But the truth is, she has a large professional staff of assistants and chefs, and maids, and gardeners that do it all for her. The Martha Stewart who does everything and does it perfectly really doesn't exist either. Real people, like the men whom Jesus picked to be his apostles, have strengths and weaknesses, abilities and limitations. Successes and failures, too. Jesus knew that when he appointed these twelve ordinary men to be his apostles, his ambassadors to the world. And he knew about your weaknesses and faults and failures when he appointed you to the roles he has given you to serve him in this world, in your job, your family, your service in the church and community. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Note carefully, not that they must prove successful, but faithful. 
Of course, Paul also explains in 1 Corinthians, The Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Peter puts it this way, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If you had been a fly on the wall during the events of today's Gospel reading, observing our Lord's speech to this group of twelve as he sends them out to preach in his name, you probably would have agreed with the leader of the Sanhedrin it will all come to nothing. How and why does this particular group of 12 men have such an extraordinary impact on our world? Because it wasn't they who did it at all, but the divine power of the message they proclaimed. You have that same power to meet the challenges of your life. The power of the word and sacrifice prayer. And when things don't go like you want them to, when you fall short, when you fail, you have the comfort of forgiveness of sins in his name. The apostles were not some kind of supernatural supermen, but as the book of Acts tells us, in and of themselves, they were ordinary men. Jesus knew that when he appointed them to be his apostles. And he knew about your weaknesses, faults, and failures when he appointed you to the roles he has given you to serve him in this world. We sometimes talk of seeing the world through rose-colored glasses. Well, God sees you and your acts of service to him through red colored glasses, colored red with the blood of his son. As God looks upon you and your efforts to serve him, Jesus' blood filters out in God's sight all your sins, shortcomings, and deficiencies. The good news is Jesus' blood makes both you and your service to him Holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. Therefore, my beloved, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain.
as they celebrate their 40th wedding anniversary today. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for the many blessings of body and soul which you have given us, although we have not deserved them. Above all, we thank you for preserving your saving word and the holy sacraments.
words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thanks be to you, O God, for revealing yourself to humanity, and for sending forth your messengers in every age. Thanks be to you for the first apostles of Christ, sent forth into all the world to preach the gospel. Thanks be to you for those who brought the good news to our land. Thanks be to you for all who, in ages of darkness, kept alive the light, or in times of indifference, were faithful to their Lord's command. Thanks be to you for all your followers in every age who have given their lives for the faith. Thanks be to you for those in our own day who have gone to the ends of the earth as heralds of your love. Thanks be to you for the innumerable company who now praise you out of every nation, tribe, people, and language. With them and 